Well, good morning, everybody, and um, it's a, a real delight to, to see everybody here. Uh, we have a you know great range of, uh, uh, of nationalities represented, which I think Schweitzer would appreciate. Um, uh, we also have a great range of ages represented, um, which is also very good. Um, and it falls to me to uh, introduce uh, in the individual speakers, and I don't want to waste any uh, more time by talking about myself at all, that's not relevant. So I want now to move to um, introduce um, Professor Ulrich Kirtner, who will be giving the uh, first um, lecture. Now, Professor Kirtner has been an ordinarius or um, top-ranking professor uh, for systematic theology um, at the Protestant faculty of the University of Vienna since 1992. He's published extremely widely and prolifically. I, I, when I saw your um, uh, the number of books you've written, Professor Kirtner, I virtually fainted um, at, the, at the thought of such diligence um, over an extended period. Um, he's, he's published in uh, the areas of biblical hermeneutics, ethics, uh, medical ethics, dogmatics, ecumenical theology, eschatology, and apocalyptic aspect, to mention just a few things. Amidst all this, he has published a number of essays on Albert Schweitzer, as well as being the co-editor um, <laughs> Uh, of two volumes of Schweitzer's Nutlass, uh, or his posthumous publications, uh, produced by C.H. Beck over an extended period. Uh, the first, Kultur und Ethik in den Weltreligionen 2001, and uh, with Johannes Zilke, uh, uh, who was particularly significant in all of this. And then um, in 2005, Wir Epigonen, the work that Schweitzer wrote in the, um, in the Gabon mainly and also in the south of France before um, he returned to Alsace during the First World War, also edited with Professor Zurka. Um, he sits on the board or advisory committees of a range of organizations uh, connected with medical ethics, uh, Genome Austria, and the Austrian Network for Patient Safety. So all these practical things, I think Schweitzer would greatly um, uh, uh, praise uh, all these places where he sits and applies actively his deep thought on um, ethics. I also know perhaps flippantly that he mentions in his, uh, uh, on his webpage that he's a member of the Royal and Ancient Polar Bear Society, uh, which um, has its origins in a small town in Norway. Um, and that would be appreciated too, that's why I'm trying to. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have Professor Kirkner here Today, he will be addressing us on the subject of the intellectual and cultural context of Schweitzer's work, Decay and Restoration of Civilization. And I hand uh, the floor over to Professor Kirtner with great gratitude. So, <clears throat> thank you very much um, for being invited in this uh, wonderful uh, conference. Unfortunately, I had not the possibility to go to Cambridge. That would have been very nice but uh, uh, I'm busy for the moment and uh, I have to apologize in the afternoon uh, for why I can't uh, participate in our conference because I have another meeting where I, uh, I'm the chair of, of a committee uh, that I had uh, to, to guide. Sorry for that. But after that, uh, I try to uh, come back to our a conference to hear what uh, other colleagues have to say to Albert Schweitzer. Yeah, my uh, my, my membership in the uh, Royal Polar Bear Society in Hammerfest is a essential contribution to reference of life and oh. reference of life. Could I just interrupt, Professor? I, I, I have started. I have started the video. Yeah. Start the video. Thank you. We, we're having a few technical glitches, but that's fine. I shall I shall be quiet and I'll leave you to get on. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. So my my topic is the intellectual and cultural context of Schweitzer's work, decay and restoration of civilization. And I have uh, several sections. I will start with some remarks to the title Via Epigon and We Epigones. One evening in 1899, in the presence of Albert Schweitzer at the Courtiers Hall in Berlin, the remark was made, after all, we are all just epigones. Schweitzer later recalled that the remark struck him like lightning because it expressed what I myself felt, he writes. 
Um, sorry for that. I, I have a little uh, cold, so but but I hope you will, will understand me at least acoustically. <laughs> so it seemed to Schweitzer as if in our spiritual life we had not only not overtaken past generations, but in many cases only lived off their achievements. From that evening at the Curtius house on, I was inwardly committed next to all my other work to a work that I entitled Via Epigonen, the We Epigones. Clearly, it took years before this, uh, his uh, thoughts on cultural philosophy were written down. In the second year in Lambarine, uh, 1914, Schweitzer began to put his thoughts down on paper in sketches, notes, and drafts, aiming at all um, at an overrepresentation. And by 1970, individual chapters has already been written. Then suddenly, in September 1970, came the order that he and his wife were to be taken immediately to Europe to an internment camp in France. In chapter 14 of uh, his book, Aus meinem Leben und Denken, From My Life and Thought, published in 1931, he tells how, due to a convenient delay of the ship, he had just a short time to prepare in two nights a French sketchy text containing the core ideas of the whole and the disposition of the already written parts that has been chapters 1 to 7 and chapter 10. Taking all the texts with him was out of the question. He left them in La Marina, entrusting them to the American missionary Ford. It was only in the summer of 1920, after returning from Uppsala, that Schweitzer received the large manuscript package back in Europe. However, Schweitzer never published the planned work during his lifetime. It was only published as part of the Albert Schweitzer's just mentioned uh, posthumous edition. The entire text from 1914 to 1918, apart from other extensive materials and working texts, is available in two large, almost equally extensive parallel collections of text. An autograph table of contents admittedly goes under a modified title, it's uh, the title Culture and the Cultural State, Kultur und Kulturstaat. Another autograph table of contents has the same title, but with the addition Ancien Titre via Epigonen. The change of title marks a change on extended plan, uh, a change or extended plan from the summer of 1915 on. If the catastrophe of the war outbreak was already a fact, there was no longer any point in noting the decline of culture and drawing attention to its dangers. The analysis revealing more epigonism now had to be followed by constructive work. Via Epigonen, we epigones was broadened into a work concerned with the reconstruction of culture. Decay and reconstruction of culture, Verfall und Wiederaufbau der Kultur, was now to become the title of a separate work, which appeared in 1923 as part one of a larger work on the philosophy of culture, together with part two of Schweitzer's philosophy of culture entitled Culture and Ethics, Kultur und Ethik. From 1999 to 2000, Part one of Philosophy of Culture was published in two volumes as part of the aforementioned posthumous editions, edition. If one wants to appreciate Schweitzer's philosophy of culture in its entirety, it is necessary to add to the epigones the posthumous volume Culture and Ethics in the World Religion that also has been mentioned, Kultur und Ethik in den Weltreligionen. As for the versions he received back in the summer of 1920, Schweitzer used them merely as a deposit of materials for his work on the various um, books of, on philosophy of culture. At any rate, the reference to the epigones is significant for the overall understanding of Schweitzer's thought on the matter. 
Schweizer used the catchword epigonism, epigonentum, to characterize the intellectual situation at the end of the 19th century. Through the cultural catastrophe of uh, the First World War, he saw himself confirmed in his judgment and at the same time challenged to overcome the epigonism that had led to the catastrophe through a new cultural philosophy and ethics that would push the legacy of the Enlightenment further, while at the same time providing a new solution to the problems at hand. Such a solution consisted in an ethics of reference for life, which attempts a synthesis of religion, of mysticism and rationalism. If we ask about Albert Schweitzer's role in today's philosophical and ethical discussion, the answer turns out to be rather sobering. Andreas Urs Sommer sums this up by saying that any reception of Schweitzer's ethics and philosophy of culture within academic philosophy has barely taken place if we overlook its potential to nurture discussions on ecology. Schweitzer, however, with the catchphrase reference for life and his um, charitable work has become the paragon of selfless humanity and thus a constituent part of popular culture. Schweitzer, the humanist and philanthrop uh, philanthropist, is indeed a great role model, yet for scholarly ethics, he is an impulse giver at best. To this day, the academic study of Schweitzer's work has remained a matter for circles of experts, as we are here, with the exception of general references and a few citations. An essential reason for the minimal reception most likely lies in the incompleteness of his theory and its inner Aporias. It was Schweitzer's intent to build up his ethics of reference for life developed in culture and ethics in this volume, Culture and Ethics, into a worldview, Weltanschauung. He had attempted this several times in his notes on a philosophy of culture, part three, that has been published posthumously without, however, achieving his goal. In his philosophy of culture, part two, the section Culture and Ethics, Schweitzer compared his ethics to the chancel of an unfinished cathedral. However, even in his Philosophy of Culture Part 3, published posthumously in two volumes under the title The World View of Reference for Life, he did not succeed but by his own admission at finishing this cathedral. Ulrich Neuenschwander, who began work on the posthumous edition, which after decades was eventually finalized under the guidance of Ulrich Lutz, captured Schweitzer's image of the cathedral as follows. Quotation, he was able only to build a bell tower to let the bells sound out throughout the country. The editor Klaus Günzler, turning the religiously inspired image into a philosophical one, suggests the diagnosis of a fundamental failure in making further interesting developments. Second part of my paper, main features of Albert Schweitzer's philosophy of culture. Main features of Albert Schweitzer's philosophy of culture. The elaboration of the first two parts of Schweitzer's philosophy of culture, which appeared in 1923 under the title Culture and Ethics, Kultur und Ethik, took place during the First World War and the following post-war years. The first version of the manuscript was written in Africa between 1914 and 1917. The final version was preceded by lectures in Uppsala and later also in Oxford, in Cambridge, in Copenhagen and Prague. The first ideas and pre preliminary work concerning Schweitzer's main work on ethics, however, date back to 1900 when Schweitzer spent the summer at the University of Berlin. Schweitzer's philosophy of culture and ethics attempted to provide an answer to the decline of Western culture that led to the First World War without being a mere reaction to the events of the war. In terms of time and subject matter, 
Schweizer's work is thus a counterpart to Oswald Spengler's philosophy of culture. The latter's development similarly dates back to the time prior to the First World War, but after 1918, it achieved a tremendous effect as a kind of retrospective sanctioning of the cultural catastrophe and prophecy post festum. Despite opposing views, starting in 1923, Schweitzer and Spengler were bound by personal friendship. Both their books, which were written independently of each other, agree at least to the extent that their philosophy of culture is mainly a critique of the present situation. Thus, both authors practice philosophy of culture as cultural critique, as a critique of culture. However, while Spengler's morphology of culture considers the decline of the West as an unchangeable fate extending over centuries, Schweitzer believes in the possibility of a reconstruction of Western culture as a renewal of its ethical foundations. The causes of cultural uh, decadence rest for Schweitzer within the area of philosophy, namely within the area of what he terms worldview, Weltanschauung, or total view of the world, total Weltanschauung. According to Schweitzer, the failure of philosophy and of religion, which is not strictly divorced from philosophy, can be above all linked to their helplessness vis-a-vis -vis Nietzsche's ethics and his inhuman doctrine of the will to power. The new path of an ethics of reference for life, according to Schweitzer, the only one still viable, makes no less <coughs> a claim than to be the only conceivable alternative to Nietzsche's philosophy, without which Nietzsche would retain the last word and the project of Western culture would have to be considered a failure. If one follows Schweitzer, the alternative to Nietzsche's thinking and to nihilism can only consist in a renewal of Western rationalism. The present epoch is apostrophized as the Middle Ages. Schweitzer's new ethics programmatically aims as, quotation, the liberation from the present Middle Ages. The ethics of reference for life is to be seen as the project of a new enlightenment shaped after the one of the 18th century or in the form of a new renaissance and a corresponding humanism. The ethics of reference for life intends to ascribe new validity to the ethical ideas of uh, or ideals of reason of both enlightenment and rationalism concerning the development of the individual to true humanity, their position in society, their material and spiritual tasks, the behavior of peoples to each other, and their integrate, um, <coughs> integrating into a humanity united by the highest spiritual goals. So that's um, For this reason, the thought of Immanuel Kant, on whose philosophy of religion, Schweitzer wrote his doctoral thesis in 1899 and who strove for a theoretical foundation of this strong popular philosophy, as Schweitzer writes, has a spe special significance for Schweitzer despite the criticisms he made of it. Nevertheless, according to Schweitzer, the point cannot be a mere repetition of the Enlightenment or even of Kant's philosophy and ethics. The outcome of the history of European philosophy in nihilism shows the failure of the previous attempts to theoretically found the ethical ideals of enlightenment and rationalism, including Kant's philosophy. Schweitzer's ethics is thus understood as rationalism purified through nihilism as rationalism of a higher kind. Such a rationalism claims to have subsumed in a synthesis the dualism of knowing and willing of epistemology and ethics also of philosophy and religion the new thought is a rationalism that has become mystical or 
a rationalistic mysticism, which is at first sight may seem contradictory, since mysticism and rationalism seems to be incompatible with each other. Schweitzer instead considers a paradoxical synthesis of mysticism and rationalism to be absolutely compelling. Quotation, if rational thought thinks itself to its end, it mouths into a necessary, in German Denknotwingen, a necessary Denknotwingen, irrational moment. This is the paradox that dominates our spiritual life. In other words, another quotation, the thought of reason devoid of presuppositions thus ends in mysticism. Uh, mysticism. Admittedly, not in a passive immersion and meditation of God or the universe, but in a thought described as, quotation, world affirming, ethical, active mysticism. We want to visualize its main features by starting from Schweitzer's semantic of culture and ethics. First of all, clarification is needed as to what Schweitzer means by culture. Culture, which conceptually, unlike in Spengler, this is important, unlike in, in Spengler, is not distinguished from civilization. It is, according to Schweitzer, and I quote him, progress, progress, the material and spiritual progress of individuals as well as of collectivities. Culture is, as Schweitzer explains, an instrument of human being in the struggle for existence, which serves to reduce the pressure of selection. However, Schweitzer's thought must not be misunderstood as biologism. For him, spiritual progress is more essential than material progress. Spiritual progress, however, is synonymous with ethical progress. This means culture is a total progress value in every respect and culture in this meaning arises only on the ground of ethical progress culture quotation culture is the result of an optimistic ethical worldview according to schweitzer ethics asks about the possibility of human beings higher development and spiritual perfection it is human beings' activity directed towards the inner perfection of their personality. As such, ethics is not science, but thought. Schweitzer defines science positivistically as, quotation, the description of objective facts, the exploration of their connections, and the drawing of conclusions of them. According to Schweitzer, however, human being cannot be objectified in this way. Therefore, no scientific ethics is conceivable, but at most a science of the history of ethics. And in Verfall und Wiederaufbau der Kultur, we have such a history, a history of, of uh, ethics and its decay. There is therefore no scientific ethics, he writes, but only a thinking ethics. But thought is an elementary process of consciousness in which my cognition transitions into experience, from, from cognition to experience. Without having to break down the references in detail here, Schweitzer's philosophizing has clearly strong commonalities with the so-called philosophy of life, or Bergson, Schopenhauer, uh, so Nietzsche. Now it is not ethics alone, but ethics together with worldview, which founds culture. Yeah? The basis of culture is ethics in combination with a worldview. That is precisely why culture is the result of an optimistic ethical worldview. Ethics for its part must be integrated into a worldview. This thesis also connects Schweitzer's thought with the philosophy of life. Schweitzer defines worldview as um, the epitome of the thoughts which society and the individual articulate within themselves concerning the nature and purpose of the world, as well as the positioning and destiny of humanity and human being within it. Without such a defined worldview, which can be optimistic or also pessimistic, 
no ethics is conceivable since the latter presupposes an answer to the question of meaning, Sinn, meaning. Culture, however, does not develop on the basis of a pessimistic worldview, which denies both world and life, but only on the basis of an optimistic ethical worldview. Schweitzer tries to prove this by the reference of the history of philosophy, and that's uh, the, the main part of, of this work that uh, came out uh, 100 years ago. According to Schweitzer, however, all previous worldviews have failed, namely because the previous philosophy has always tried to shape its worldview by means of so-called metaphysics. For Schweitzer, the last insight of knowledge is that the world is for us in every respect a mysterious appearance of the universal will to life. That is a quotation. A mysterious appearance of the universal will of, to life for which no meaningfulness can be claimed itself. The world, he wrote, the world is horrible in its glorious, senseless in its sensible, sorrowful in its joyful dimensions. Therefore, in Schweitzer's judgment, any attempt to derive ethics from the supposed meaningfulness of a world interpreted metaphysically must fail. From this, Schweitzer draws the consequence of reversing the foundational relationship between worldview and life view. Worldview, life view. The worldview, Weltanschauung, grows out from the view of life, Lebensanschauung, and not the other way around. However, the sought after view of life is, according to Schweitzer, the attitude of reference for life. Schweitzer, uh, Schweitzer famously formulates the basic axiom of this doctrine of lever, uh, reference of uh, for life as follows you know true philosophy has to take as a starting point the most immediate and most comprehensive fact of consciousness the letter reads i am life that wills to live admits life that wills to live in this sentence life view lebensanschauung is placed above world view weltanschauung willing, wollen, above knowing. And so Descartes' tenet cogito ergo sum is invalidated by vivo ergo sum. Reference for life is ethical because it is captivated by an endless, unfathomable, propulsive will in which all being is founded. The fundamental experience, or in German, in German it's uh, written Grunderfahrung, fundamental experience, Grunderfahrung, the fundamental experience of reference for life is the experiencing of a universal will to live that operates within us and other living beings. In religious language, this term can be equated with the quotation, mysterious ethical good God personality that I cannot recognize as such in the world, but experience only as a mysterious will in myself. Now, I cannot recognize the God personalized uh, will of life, but, but I uh, can experience this in, in, in my, my own life. This universal will to live is outside of the human being, opposed by the particular will to live in the struggle of all against all for survival. Letter, um, um, a sentence written by, by uh, Schweitzer, the world is the gruesome spectacle of uh, the self-divisiveness of the will to live, to life. In us humans, however, the will to life appears as one which wants to become one with another will to life. Because the universal will to life becomes conscious of itself in us, an elementary concept of responsibility is resolved in the attitude of reference for life. Ethics is now the quotation, subjective, extensively and intensively boundless responsibility for all life entering its sphere 
as experience and sought to be realized by human beings inwardly liberated from the world. So synonymous uh, for, for culture, uh, an extensively and intensively boundless responsibility for all life. Therefore, the basic principle of morality, which is necessary for thought is, good is to preserve life and promote life, evil is to destroy life and inhibit life. But otherwise, ethics consists in experiencing the compulsion to give to all will to life the same reference for life as one gives to one's own. A strong ethical motive of reference for life is compassion for everything that lives. Nevertheless, one would fall short if one wanted to dismiss Schweitzer's ethics as an ethics of compassion or interpret it biographically as a mere reflex on the, of the sensitivity of other suffering that had existed in him since his earliest youth, in particular for the suffering of animals, which had been largely ignored by philosophy. Compassion, he writes, compassion is too narrow to be considered the epitome of uh, the ethical, for ethics does not only have to do with suffering, but also with pleasurable and active life. Love says already more, as it embraces in itself the sharing of suffering, joy and striving. And so, Schweitzer can assert, mainly reference for life commands the same as the ethical principle of love. Only reference for life carries within itself the foundation of the commandment of love and demands compassion for all creatures. In other words, the fundamental principle of an ethics of reference for life is universal responsibility for life, which includes compassion and love, but is not exhausted in either. With this ethics of responsibility for life, Schweitzer believed to have solved the problems of worldview and meaning sind problematic in, in German. And, and that's the basis of, for his understanding of, of culture and cultural progress. The fundamental experience of reference for life says, quotation, my life carries its meaning in its own self. It consists in living the highest idea that emerged in my world to live, the idea of reference for life. Thereupon I give value to my life and all will to live that surrounds me, I hold on to action and create values. And there is no culture without creating such values. So it's important to see that there doesn't exist uh, um, <coughs> values in a metaphysical way, but uh, from my experience of life, I am in, uh, forced to create values. Schweitzer's ethics is thus not only an ethics of responsibility, but at the same time an ethic of values that admittedly does not take as its starting point a priori existing values, yeah? but the values that have to be created through the will to, life, uh, to live operating with me. That's important for his understanding for culture. It's not uh, uh, ethics of values in a metaphysical way, but creating these values is uh, the starting point for what he calls culture. Furthermore, Schweitzer's ethic claims to provide a synthesis of philosophical and religious ethics. It frankly bears soteriological traits. Johann Nein uh, theology shimmers through when Schweitzer characterized his eth ethics as an ethics of being different from the world. Anyone who actualizes the fundamental experience of reference for life knows, quotation, I am delivered from the world. That's Joe 9 uh, uh, theology, I am delivered from the world. With this, we conclude the depiction of Schweitzer's ethics in its main features. Now, a further line of thought, we have to ask whether Schweitzer can indeed substantiate the logical necessity of reference for life and whether nihilism and the crisis of ethics and culture can indeed be overcome in the only way that he still considered possible. So my third section of this paper is 
uh, entitled Questions to Schweitzer's Ethics and Theory of Culture. Schweitzer's new approach of reference for life considers itself, as we have seen, as the only convincing alternative to a philosophy that has failed with respect to nihilism in general and Nietzsche in particular. Nietzsche's philosophy of the will to power, which rejects any humanitarian or even Judeo-Christian ethics, is opposed by a philosophy of the will to life, which for its part has multi-layered connections to the philosophical tradition, especially into Spinoza, to Kant, to Fichte, Schelling and Schopenhauer. The idea of the universal will to live which opposes the many particular worlds to live and reaches self-consciousness in human being, in whom it brings about redemption, goes back to Schelling. The program of giving an ethical content to self-perfection in the affirmation of the world and life is connected to Fichte. Above all, however, the motive of universal compassion connects Schweitzer's ethic with the thought of Schopenhauer. Put very simply, one can say that Schweitzer tries to go beyond Nietzsche by going back to the philosophy of Schopenhauer. It's very simply, but maybe that, that may help for, for discussing it. When it comes to Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, Schweitzer's conclusion is life affirmation and life negation are both ethical to some context, extent. Carried to the end, they become unethical. So. From the beginning, there, there is an ethical idea for some extent, but carried to the end, life affirmation as well as life negation become unethical. The new approach of reference for life is an ethics of affirmation of the universal will to live, which for the sake of his affirmation includes the particular negation of life. In this respect, one could simplify and say that Schweitzer has a synthesis in mind which is supposed to subsume in itself the moments of truth of both Schopenhauer's and Nietzsche's philosophy. The question remains whether Schweitzer succeeded in such a synthesis. The main problem that arises at this point is how can I arrive at a universal responsibility for life from the realization of being life that wills to live among life that also wants to live. To this, Schweitzer responds that with the reference for life, a fundamental concept of responsibility is immediately given. But is this really the case? Why should the realization that I am life that wills to live emit life that wills to live compel me to promote and preserve the life of others? It is not precisely the brutal uh, question. Is it not precisely the brutal struggle for survival and my attempt to assert myself in the struggle, the fitting consequence of the fundamental experience of my will to live? In other words, is it not precisely Nietzsche with his doctrine of the will to power that draws the only correct conclusion from the fundamental experience invoked by Schweitzer? Is not the life that is affirmed precisely that our devouring or being devoured, his life as such is declared as the highest value, then it is more vegetating, meaning, spoken in the terms of antiquity, a zoe that is split off from bios. Of course, Schweitzer doesn't want to say this. Thus, he implies that the experience underlying the reference for life confronts us with the universal will to live, which in the language of religion is to be equated <coughs> with God. This divine will to live, however, urges men to create values and to realize ideals, meaning culture. Of course, it must be counted that these values and ideals are by no means derivable from nature or the evolutionary process as such, but are the relics of a philosophy and an ethics of values, which already tacitly presupposes what it wants to derive. Schweitzer claims that in the concept of will that of responsibility is implied, but this is not the case. Logically, 
there is no path leading from my will and the will of other life to a concept of responsibility. That's my thesis. Now it may be objected that according to Schweitzer, the fundamental experience of one's own will to live in the midst of others will to live is more than the experience of one's own particular will. It is, it is the experience of a universal will to live that becomes the instance before which I can feel responsibility. Quotation, in us free moving beings capable of a deliberate purposeful um, activity the urge for perfection is given in such a way that we want to bring ourselves and everything that can be influenced by us to the highest material and spiritual value. Again, this is the idea of cultural and cultural progress. Yeah? We tried to, to get every uh, uh, form of life uh, to the highest material and spiritual value. This knowledge is supposed to be included in the experience of reference for life, which is so elementary that Schweitzer can speak, uh, can speak of an instinctive reference for life. But this is to be questioned. I think it must be denied that from the axiom, I am life that wants to live in the midst of life that wants to live, it may be concluded that there is a universal will to life that compels the creation of values and the realization of ideals. In fact, if the reference for life is supposed to contain a concept of ideals and values, it is by no means an elementary experience of our existence, but a highly complex idea, which cannot deny its connection to certain varieties of the value of philosophy and ethics. Above all, however, it is not clear in what way the elementary experience of being life that wants to live in the midst of life that wants to live necessitates the position of a universal will to life as an instance of ethical responsibility with regard to the ethics of reference for life at least in the formulation found in schweitzer's work there can be no question of a logical necessity as he claims additionally Further questions are to be addressed to Schweitzer's approach. As simple as the fundamental ethical postulate of this ethics might seem, namely that it is good to preserve and promote life and even to harm or destroy life, its practical application is difficult. Since one's own life can only live by destroying the lives of others, reference for life inevitably ends up in ethical conflict. Schweitzer speaks passionately of an absolute ethics which would be above any pragmatic realism. However, this absolute ethics um, offers no standards for the solution of the ethical conflict as a limit situation, rather it institutionalizes it as a permanent conflict which, against Schweitzer's declared intention, by principle allows one to suspend themselves from ethical standards. Werner Picht even questions whether among Schweitzer's followers and even among his co-workers, there is even a single one who has really unreservedly embraced the relentlessness and exclusivity of his ethical thinking. Strictly speaking, Schweitzer's rigorous fostering of a reference for life contradicts the very nature of his, of this life, which is based on killing and consuming other life. But if killing is completely unavoidable, since it is necessary for survival, then it cannot at all be declared evil in principle, as it has happened in Schweitzer's thought. The morally acting human being, however, must not only acknowledge the necessity of killing as such, but in so far as his actions are to be ethically justified, whether they want or not, they are also forced to make decisions which presuppose value judgments. This necessity, however, is in contradiction to Schweitzer's ethical principle, which fundamentally declares all life, human as well as animal and vegetable, 
to be of equal value. Critics object that both a natural order, according to which living beings are organized at different levels, and moral consciousness point to a special position of human being, which Schweitzer himself basically accepts in practical life, but which he does not justify to theoretically within the framework of his, ethic, his ethics. As a principle of an absolute ethics, the reference for life would have to drive human being to the complete surrender of their own life and thus directly or indirectly to suicide. Acting according to reference of life in the sense of Schweitzer on the one hand is only possible if that is understood as a principle not of an absolute ethics, but contrary to Schweitzer's postulate of a relative one. However, since Schweitzer doesn't sketch out any further criteria of judgment for such an ethics and just uh, perpetuates the ethical conflict, ethical behavior becomes a mannering between, uh, between life affirmation and life negation. On the other hand, the idea of a universal responsibility leads Schweitzer into a heteronomy that is difficult to bear. He writes, an uncompromising believer is reference for life. Even my own happiness reference for life does not grant me. And at last, you must pay a price for it. One wonders why this is so. Biographically, this attitude of Schweitzer can be well explained, but it hardly justifies philosophically the institute, uh, institute, institutionalization of the bad conscience. On the contrary, its consequences are ethically problematic because all carefree pleasure, all carefree leisure of men, but with it also an essential part of higher culture, and we're talking about culture, would be called into question by the inexorably consuming service to life. Today, Schweitzer is often mentioned as the garden of an ethics, which uh, criticizes and overcomes the objectivation of nature that began with Descartes, as well as anthropocentric thinking and its deadly consequences for human being and nature. The nowadays common judgment of Descartes associated with such evaluation cannot be discussed here. However, it should not be overlooked that Schweitzer, despite his criticism of an anthropocentric narrowing of philosophy and ethics, is himself a staunch advocate of the modern idea of progress. Reference for life thus compels us to imagine and will all the progress of which human beings and humanity are capable. And this is a certain understanding of culture again. Progress is culture, but culture is dominion. And not only in the sense of, as we would say today, a qualitative growth, the dominion over human beings disposition, but precisely in the sense of the dominion over nature and its forces. It is to be asked to what extent Schweitzer is in fact initiating a new way of thinking as it is demanded today in the context of the discussion about the chances of survival of human being and nature. In conclusion, looking at Nietzsche and the age of nihilism, the question must be asked to what extent Schweitzer really takes into account the collapse of German idealism and the questionability of metaphysical, uh, metaphysical thought. Schweitzer believed that based on, our, um, uh, on a reference for life, culture carries its values so much in itself that even the certainty of a cessation of humankind in the foreseeable future could not disqualify our effort to culture or effort for culture. Yeah, even if humankind will be um, uh, would, would come to an end on the earth, uh, that's not an argument ag against uh, uh, caring for culture, um, Schweitzer says. Should we not now say that Schweitzer tries to support the principle of reference for life by means of the very philosophy who failure 
uh, who, um, uh, excuse me, should we not say that Schweitzer tries to support the principle of reference for life by means of the very philosophy whose failure, looking back on the 19th century, must be acknowledged? But then it is to be questioned whether the reference for life, as Schweitzer defines and interprets it, is really strong enough to overcome nihilism. <laughs> to Schweitzer's credit, it is worth saying that he himself dealt with the question in ever new attempts, as it's shown in his posthumous Philosophy of Culture Part 3. Philosophy of Culture Part 3. He himself is well aware that universal life in itself does not provide sufficient grounds for ethics. Just as the earth arose from a cosmic catastrophe, so it will end in one in the distant future. Neither can, um, it's a quotation um, by Schweitzer, uh, neither can the conviction that the purpose of the earth is fulfilled in the life that arises on it be justified in terms of natural science, nor can the existence of humankind as the highest life be regarded as certain. That's a quotation from uh, the, the work of Schweitzer. Apart from the fact that humankind could be carried away by epidemics. <coughs> That's an idea I found uh, by Schweitzer and, and not in the COVID uh, epoch we had uh, just uh, behind us. So there is a possibility that we could be <coughs> carried away by epidemics. The age of technology and means of mass destruction entails the danger that humankind will extinguish itself. That is why Schweitzer concludes, quotation, an ethical worldview that can bear the thought that human being could be something temporary in the world, only this is truly solid. Schweitzer finds a certain comfort in the thought, quotation, that a fire does not blaze up in one but in many flames. So our being, unser Sein in German, does not reach its highest point only in the development of living beings on our earth, but also in a variety of developments that takes place in the spatial and temporal infinity. This thought can be understood as a naturalistic variant of a universal and futuristic eschatology in spite of the fact that Schweitzer understands the traditional eschatological ideas of Christianity conceived as <coughs> through on, a thorough going eschatology as obsolete. In the end, Schweitzer's ethics of reference for life is based on religion or theology. With that, it draws on premises that nowadays are in no way universally acknowledged as it demonstrated, for example, from a utilitarian point of view in Peter Singer's critique, Singer does not share with Schweitzer the matter of inanimate ethics, yet at, the coast, uh, yet at the cost of the protective rights of the unborn or the totally disabled newborn, rights regarded as universal by Schweitzer. Even if, Singer's, uh, even if Singer's objections to the idea of sanctity of life or reference for life are themselves poorly founded and open to criticism, this does not change anything in the evident problems of justification for Schweitzer's ethics. But also Hans Jonas approach of an ethics of responsibility contains a tacit religion or metaphysical promises, the premises, not promises, and premises. Otherwise, a cryptic theology underlies the concept of life against which, for instance, Karl Barth expressed himself when he wrote Life is not a second God. Yet in spite of all the unsolved philosophical as well as theological problems, Schweitzer's pioneering work in the areas of ecological ethics and intercultural or transcultural ethics remains undisputed. Perhaps one should generally interpret Schweitzer less as a theoretician um, a, few, a theoretician of morality than a psychologist of morality, as Heike Baranske suggests. In her view, reference for life is not a principle of justification of ethics, 
but a moral psychological principle, principle of sensitization for the formation of acceptance of responsibility. Committed life praxis and narrative reasoning cannot be played off against an ethics of principles that puts to the test the principles and norms that guide life praxis. Yet such a test does not give rise to a culture, uh, to a culture of responsibility in which an ethics of responsibility must be embedded. Charles Taylor, in his Sources of the Self, profoundly criticized with a view to Descartes, a form of reason that he denotes as disengaged reason. Disengaged reason deliberately breaks with ordinary corporeal experience. It downright does violence to it by conceiving of the sensual world, the sensual world and its phenomena as something disenchanted, as mere mechanism, as devoid of any spiritual essence or expressive dimension. Disengagement for Taylor is always correlative, correlative of an objectification and objectification a given domain involves depriving it of its normative force for us. To come to an end, the whole of Schweitzer's thought and also his ideas of culture, throughout which he understood himself as a renewer of enlightenment rationality, can be understood as a protest against disengaged reason. His ethics aspires precisely to an engaged reason in which knowing passes into experiencing. In that sense, it remains unabatedly up to date. And thank you very much for uh, following my paper. Thank you so much.